Hello, everybody, and welcome to Three Point Perspective, the podcast about illustration, how to do it, how to make a living at it, and how to make an impact in the world with your art. I'm Jake Parker. I'm Lee White. And I'm Will Terry. And all three of us are professional illustrators. We've all illustrated for all the major publishers in the business. We've uh, got somewhere around 50 or 70 books between us, and we've all taught illustration in university art programs. That is correct. Each week we take questions from you, our trusty reader, audience, listener, what do we call our people? Audience. Uh, yeah. The, all those people out there, shout out to all the people out there reading this podcast. All the people. This is uh, <laughs> being transcribed and sent to your <laughs> Anyway, we take questions from all of you guys uh, about the topic of illustration, business stuff, image stuff, technique stuff, and we give you invaluable advice. Sometimes we argue, sometimes we agree. But every time you're going to learn something brand spanking new. Sounds good. All right, guys. Uh, I get, I, is there any follow-up? There's no follow-up really on anything. You, you didn't get anybody asking questions or fighting back on anything we said last last week. Not that I'm aware. Or previous of. podcasts. I don't hmm. think so. Okay, let's get down to it. Not that there's not a lot to fight about back against. Well, I have a question, I guess, as a follow-up. Now, since... Uh, you know, a couple of months ago when we did the NFTs, or I guess a month and a half ago, mm -hmm. Bitcoin has crashed. Did the mm. NFTs crash with Bitcoin? That's Is there a, a relationship there? A lot of them. Uh, yeah, yeah. So what I th here's the here's my understanding. Is uh, definitely the NFT market has like slowed down, and the the those big sales aren't happening like they used to. And I think what it is is it's tied to um, it's tied to crypto currency because um, that's what people are using to buy NFTs. And so if you've mm. got mm -hmm. a surplus, you've got all you know you've 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 got twenty bitcoins and they're all worth sixty thousand. What is it to spend you know twenty thousand on a uh, you know on a on a JPEG, right? <laughs> So, but now when your Bitcoin's cut in half, you're like, uh, you know what? I'm not going to frivolously spend. This is just Jake's, you know, the, you're, you're talking Jake's to takes. a guy. Jake's takes, right? <laughs> you're talking to a guy who spends most of his day like drawing in a sketchbook, you know, doodling, coloring with crayons, right? Or, so, ma or making, <laughs> making lectures for classes, which is- Or making lectures. Well, yeah, this last <laughs> month, two months, it's been- Two months. Straight up making- Lectures. The lecture I'm working on now for how to design book covers. I am doing one of those things where you keep turning over rocks and finding stuff, and you're like, "Oh, I have to talk about that." I know, and me you, too. And Same thing. My my slides are well over a hundred now wow. oh <laughs> for <gosh>. this one. <laughs> It's a, it's a lot of teacher drift, I'd call, I'll call that, where you, yeah, <laughs> you just kind of, you got to give it something. But uh, you guys, our Children's Book Pro class launched uh, a week ago now. I don't know when this podcast is coming out, but we're, we're, we're in week two on it now. So it's, yeah, it's, it's awesome. It is going to come available uh, again. That's another email that we're getting all the time is like, when's it going to come available um, mm -hmm. again? Because we shut, we shut down the enrollment and we got a lot of people interested in it and a lot of people signed up for it. And we just had to, had to, had to cap it, but it is going to come available again at some point. So, uh, mm -hmm. thank so you just go to Children's Book Book Pro. Pro. Sign up. There, there, there you sign up. But I can't wait for everyone to like um, see this uh, this covers lecture because I I haven't ever, ever seen anything like it, and I think I think I'm I think it's good. I do. I really think it's good. You guys might be like, that. "Come on, Jake. I'll be the judge of that." Because me, me and Jamie Zollers <laughs> have taught the uh, a children's book uh, or a yeah, covers Lee's really proud of that one, Jake. It's a good one. 10 week mm -hmm. course on covers only. So one, here's so, the thing. One of them's better and one of them's worse. One of them's definitely worse. Well, Thanks, 10 week Will. class versus Jake's <laughs> versus Jake's takes. No, I'm just kidding. There, it's a different experience. I mean, this is going to be, uh, you know, the, the, we're dealing with just picture books in the children's book pro class. So Jake's dealing a little bit different kind of thing than mm -hmm. Jamie and I are doing, which, which leans a little more, um, YA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, should we get down to our questions here? Let's answer yeah. some questions. What do we got in the hopper? Uh, in the hopper. Question number one. 
I lost my tab for where, where <laughs> these questions are. Oh, there it is. <laughs> All right. Question number one at 45, the clock is ticking. Okay. Every once in a while we get these, these questions where I'm like, I'm in my forties, you know, I want to do illustration. How do I do this? Essentially this comes from Lisa and she says, um, I started seriously painting and drawing at age 40. I just turned 45 with kids and other family responsibilities. Going to art school is not an option, but I'm happy to learn from artists online. Um, this is my dilemma. Number one, I can't decide which medium to focus on. And number two, I can't decide what I want to do with my art. Mm. So medium and what to do with it. Um, she says she explore, enjoys exploring different mediums. She loves watercolor, acrylics, Photoshop, ink. So she's she likes all these different mediums, but she can't decide what she wants to do with it. Um, <clears throat> she says, I do want to make art my career. And if I were 18, I wouldn't mind taking more years to explore. But at this stage of my life, just taking time out of everyday responsibilities to make art is already difficult as it is. I really want to make up my mind to focus on one or two mediums and make it great. I also can't decide what kind of art I want to make. Long story short, here's a list that I've explored in the past few years. Children's book illustration and writing, wall decal design, abstract painting and acrylics, watercolor painting of florals, fabric pattern design, t-shirt design, nursery wall art prints, face painting, should I decide on which medium to focus on before I decide which path I should take? Or should I decide what I want to do with my art before I decide on a medium? Or is it normal to explore while I'm still learning? So, what do you Oh, let me take this think? one. Let me take this one. This is a person after my own heart. Um, mm -hmm. I, uh, some people that I knew in college, they painted a certain way in college. And then they painted that same way after college, you know, a couple of years after college. And then they still paint the same exact way. They've just found their thing. Mm -hmm. And I've never been cut from that cloth. I, mm -hmm. I've been all over the place. You know, in my books, I've done, I don't know if there's anybody else. I mean, there's a few people that really change styles quite a bit, which we've talked about on other podcasts. Maybe they switch around with mediums based on the style they're using. But I have done it. it I've done books in pastel, acrylic, digital, watercolor, oil, all different um, because I never settle on it because all of the mediums, to be honest with you, well, I'll, I'll change the way I was going to phrase that. They make me mad. <laughs> they make me angry. It's a family show, so I don't want to, but they really do make me mad. I mean, let's look at acrylics. Okay. You got the option of it. Uh, you know, oh, it's, it's great that it dries fast. It dries in two minutes. And then depending on your location, uh, you mm -hmm. know, it might drive even faster than that if you're in a low humidity kind of situation. Right. Um, when I've worked in acrylics here in Arizona, I haven't done it since I moved back, but when I was, you know, younger and first starting out, I was just like, put that paper, it was like a marker. <laughs> you put it that really paint is. down, it's dry. It's dry. <laughs> By the time you go get some new paint on your brush and come back, it's already dry. I don't, I don't know where they're talking about. I mean, there it is doesn't dry fast. And it didn't dry fast enough when I was using it. Really? I'm serious. Yeah, because of dry brushing. Like sometimes you it, want would, it, dry. it would bother me that I would burn it out, you know, like because I was. Yeah, depending on your technique. On it. But it, it, I yeah. mean, typically it dries too fast for everybody. I mean, I, what I would love is like a 30 minute window. And there is some advancements in acrylic um, where they have moved that open time quite a bit. There's, there's, um, a couple of different lines. There's one from Liquitex called open acrylics and they do extend it, but I still have not gotten a consistent open time with that one, depending on your conditions. And it's just frustrating. And then, okay, go over to the other side with oil. Oh my gosh, really? It's, it's going to take me, you know, up to three days. If you use a lizard and crimson, that's a slow drying um, pigment. You know, you got three days of, of waiting for it to be truly dry and then, and then six months of curing and who, so who, what illustrator has time for that? So my point is all the, all the mediums have a drawback, um, and all the mediums have a pro. And so what I recommend people to do is a find one that feels natural, like watercolor. When I found watercolor, I just felt very natural in it, even though I wasn't great at it. I mm -hmm. felt natural. The, the image ended up being something that I liked, even though I was fumbling with it and stuff. But you can combine all this stuff together and get the pro of each uh, medium without the con. And so I really advise a uh, multimedia approach. Uh, you know, you start with acrylic, 
You can go to watercolor on top of acrylic. A lot of people don't know that. And then you can go to oil on top of that. And you can bang out paintings in a day where you add, where you do have infinite blending, but you also have a quick dry time for the, for the block and color pencils on top of all that stuff to tighten up your details. So you can, you can and then you can collage in stuff. And so there's just a, a lot of play that you're gonna have to do though, to figure out how these things work together. Um, unless you find one where you like finally go in, like if you just like tried oil and that's like, oh my gosh, this is a perfect thing. Some people do that and they love mm -hmm. it, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But if you don't, I would think about maybe mixing and matching, uh, but it's gonna involve play. There's no way you're just gonna be able to say, okay, I'm just gonna do it in acrylics and that's gonna be what I stick with. Um, it's kind of boxing yourself in. What do you guys think? I think, I think you choose the thing you want to make first. <laughs> mm -hmm. Good like point. You, find, you know, I think you choose that and then you master that craft. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's like, you know, she, she talked about t-shirt design or nursery wall art prints or face painting, you know, if this, and, and, and she says, this is, she wants this to be a career. So it needs to make money. It's not just a, a hobby. Right. She just doesn't, she doesn't want to dump money into it. She wants to like actually have it be profitable. So I always come back to this. It's like, uh, it's Mike Rose says this, it's follow opportunity, bring your passion with you. And, and really, I think that, I think that's where it's at. It's you, you see what, um, you see what you're good at. You see what makes money. And you find where that overlaps to where you are making, you know, the Venn diagram, where that overlaps, that's where you're going to get work. That's where you're going to be successful. And ultimately, I think that's where you're going to be the happiest. So it's like people keep coming back and saying, I want, I need, you know, a friend of mine saw these nursery prints that you did. And I, you know, I was wondering if you did something like this. Maybe you do that. And that leads to another person saying, you know, pretty soon you've got 20 different sales of, you know, decorating specific nurseries and you're getting photographs taken and, and you've got a website built out and maybe you love, um, you know, maybe you really, really love, I don't know, portrait painting, but this is pretty cool and it's fun and it's, and, and you know, you're not going to get a job painting anybody's portrait, but you are going to continue to get these, these nursery gigs, essentially follow that nursery gig and, and, see where see where it'll go and uh and and try to master uh some sort of craft that will feed into feed into that and so uh, in the short of it is i think a lot of times artists are really good about putting carts before horses and it's like i gotta post on instagram so i'm gonna sketch a bunch of stuff that i can post on instagram and and i gotta feed the algorithm i gotta make youtube videos or i gotta you know uh, I got to do this. I got to do that. And ultimately, like at the end of the day, you have a bunch of Instagram posts and you have a bunch of like filled sketchbooks, but you don't have anything of real value that you could like sell. Right. And if you're wanting to make this a career, I think you start top and work your way down. You, you figure mm -hmm. out what is that thing that's going to actually lead to a stable, sustainable, like way of living. And and then you do all this other stuff to support that thing. And I think that's, I, I think that's where it goes, where you go with that. I, I agree with that. I, I have a problem with the question in general, because I think that it's, um, I think as an artist, if it, to me, it seems like what she's asking is what market should I work in? Mm -hmm. and, and I, that's like asking what flavor ice cream should I get? the ice cream shop mm -hmm. you know yeah. Good like, road. like i totally. like right right i, I um, agree with that actually mud pie <laughs> um the, the thing is like as an artist you have to if you're going to be successful you have to figure out what you love to do and then try to figure out what market you're going to be be best able to mm -hmm. to come closest to making the thing you like and making money and you know where they intersect right mm -hmm. and if you don't if you if you say well, I think I'll do T-shirt design because I can think I can make more money there. If your heart's not in it, I mean, like that's that's exactly what I did. When I got out of school, I had to make money, or I wasn't. You know, I had I had a window 
where my wife was going to let me try to be a, a freelance illustrator. And I think that window was pretty short mm-hmm. because, you know, she was asking me questions like, now, how are you going to get work? You know, and I'm like, well, here's what my teachers have told me kind of works. You know, you send out some postcards and to editorial clients and, and then maybe some of them, you know, a few of them will call you and give you a job. Mm-hmm. And then you kind of start there. And then over time you, you keep some of those clients and then you get more <laughs> and then magically, mm-hmm. deliciously, you'll have a career at some point. Right. And uh, that's actually how it worked for me. But I also was scrambling because I knew that if I wasn't making money pretty soon, that dream was going to come to a a screeching halt and I was going to have to get some sort of real job and I wasn't qualified to do anything. So it meant I was, I was going to have to be consigned to making kind of a tradesman's wage, which ironically today, you know, plumbers can do quite well. Mm -hmm. Um, Welders can do quite well, but back in the day, (laughs) and I had my heart set. I had some, some mentors that were really successful in illustration and they were making six figures. And I was like, this is my, this is my way to make good money and to avoid a real job, Mm -hmm. you know? (laughs) Cause that's really the goal there. Yeah. You you don't want to have to put on (laughs) pants and have to go somewhere every day. That's right. So So in order to work in my slippers, I was like, I have to work really hard. So I coming back to this, I didn't have the luxury of, of, of going, well, let's see which one. I had to just pick the thing that I thought was, I was, could make the most money at the quickest and go for it. And that was editorial work. And I ended up following that genre of little, like the Brad Holland, little people in business suits and white tie, you know, white shirts and ties with big objects doing these conceptual things. And, and I did quite well with that and, and was able to start a career, but really quickly I found that I hated it, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's why, that's why I'm answering it this way. Like you can be successful Mm -hmm. and you might find yourself hating the very thing. I mean, you're going to get asked to do the thing that that you're doing again and again and again and again. I also tried gallery work and found I didn't have anything to say. Mm-hmm. I'm, I, I like to narrate. That seems about right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, I like, I love illustrating a narrative. I love telling a yeah. story. I don't. That's the same thing gallery work is, by the way. You just, you just choose the narrative of what you're illustrating. It doesn't, right. It's not like you're just like, oh, I'll paint some decoration. I don't know. And I what's thought, funny is today I would love to and get some gallery work. There's some, you know, I I'd thought love we'll show of, of giant 20 foot by 20 foot hamburgers paintings <laughs> was amazing. It said <laughs> everything I wanted it to I'm, say. I'm going out to Colorado. <laughs> Me and Jake and Will are going to get together and we're going to do landscape paintings in the Rockies. And we're going to have a show. Sounds think? good. <laughs> I already my my landscape paintings are going to be painted in Photoshop. <laughs> no, no, no. You so you told me I've got to save the text. I'm dying to try oils. I can't wait to well, try out some physical media. Butter, I've got the thick, text creamy thing. butter. That oils, was until Jake. I heard you say they take three days to dry. Well, you, can add, you, can add stuff to you can add you can add mediums to them now that to, that speed them up to about a day. But you, but you got to paint it all in one in one go and uh, and. We'll see it. We'll see how Jake does with a new medium. That that'll be a fun. Podcast. Anyway, all right. Back to Lisa's question. My my summation is: follow what you love. I mean, what ask answer the question? What do you love doing? And and you can't yeah, well, say you love it all. I mean, like there's certain things that you really like doing. I mean, in, in art, think you know, there's pieces of art that you really love making. There's there's identify the things that you love and identify the things that you don't like as much. Well, also, and and, and this and the skill set that overlaps that too. I mean, like for example, I use sports as an analogy a lot. But what if you liked basketball, football, baseball, and and golf? Well, you can't do all those things. Which one of those things do you like? And then also that you have some kind of talent at because yeah. you can't say, "Oh, I like portrait painting," but I can't draw or paint a likeness. Yeah. Um, well, and even even in like say you pick basketball, are you a center? Are you a forward? Are you a guard? Right. <laughs> you know, right. like Good pick point. one of those. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and and that really is the answer. You want to know the secret to all this? It's the more narrow and niche and specific you can go, the more successful you'll be. Yep. And, and not only you, that, but the more the easier it is too on you because then you don't have the whole world of choices to make. You right. only have once. Mm-hmm. Yep. 
It really so is. True. And the times that I've had the most success are the times that that I focused on the one the one thing. Think and of, that's yeah. City yeah, think slickers, of right? think of In and Out Burger. They make oh, burgers. They don't make chicken slickers. sandwiches. <laughs> they don't they don't make fish sandwiches. You can't get spaghetti there. Mm-hmm. You can't get chicken nuggets. That's a good point. Mm-hmm. You can't get do, a salad. Do you guys ever do you guys ever watch the uh the show, the Gordon Ramsay show? I think it was called Hell's Kitchen. Yeah. Is it it, it, it would talk to the the main focus of the show, they go he goes in and saves these dying restaurants. Well, it's a great analogy for illustrators too, because nine times out of 10, the restaurant had a 20 page menu and they're failing. Like, oh, if we just keep offering more dishes, people will come to our restaurant. No, people don't want that. Like, like Will's saying, when he came in and did, he scrapped their menu and he'd yeah. be like, what are you going to make? And it'd be like, you have three now entrees to choose from instead of a yeah. hundred. Kitchen not nightmares, the food is not, not Hell's Kitchen. Oh, right, right. Kitchen nightmares. Yeah. That's right. And um, but it was always interesting because that's the first thing he would do. He'd come in, look at that menu, and it was almost always too much. And I and I think illustrators fall victim to that. You try to be Way everything to everyone. You're nothing to any to everyone. You know. Boom. Yeah. We just yeah. we just answered that question for her. I never understood. I don't. I know that Food Network is successful, but <laughs> I don't understand how. An entire TV like empire based on something you can't actually eat or yeah, taste. Watching other You're people. You're just watching eat. it. And I, now it's, it's on YouTube. Now now there's so me. many cooking channels on YouTube. Like how come there isn't um there's but Food can, Network, right? But how come there isn't and there's MTV, there's music TV, yeah. right? Because you can listen to music. I get that. You can listen to music and you can like learn behind the scenes of, and you can experience it exactly how it's meant to be experienced. But Food Network, I can't eat the hamburger that they made and I can but, make my version of it, but it's not going to be the thing that they made. Here's the thing. You're not a foodie and you don't cook. Yeah. See, I cook, my wife. She's I cook and foodie. I watch Will's him all the time. I watch Sam the cooking guy because on YouTube because he'll make things that I want to make. And so, yeah, he's tasting it and I don't get to taste it. That just makes me want to make it even yeah, more. Yeah, you're not you're not the demographic. I mean, you need to be yeah. the demographic of my wife. Sorry, I Jake. Her, I see her on her phone, and I'll be like, "Hey, what are you what are you reading?" And I, you know, I expect her to say some kind of news or something like that. She's like, "I'm looking deep into crab cakes." You know, it's something real <laughs> yeah. super super specific <laughs> that she's researching. So how how cakes. come there isn't um, art network like the art channel? Because how come that never became a thing? We're dumber than ball players. I mean, I mean, it's 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 a proven model, actually. If you look at look at Bob Ross, people love that to watch mm-hmm. art being made in real time. I think it would do quite well. Mm-hmm. I mean, essentially, you've got art YouTube. YouTube sort of out of necessity filled that that gap. But it's amazing to me that, like in the '90s, when there's all these cable stations, like the boom of cable, um, why there wasn't the art network, or the art station. You know, it's a good it's a you, good point, actually. You get That's yourself a, a fuzzy wig, you could do it, Jake. It's not like there isn't a shortage <laughs> of like eccentric, very filmable artists. I know there's a lot of them that like like to keep to themselves, mm-hmm. but then you've got you've got so many that are just like, you know, the Andy Warhols, right? <laughs> you know, the Salvador Dali's, stuff like that. Okay. Getting off topic, but let's let's get back yeah. to it. Okay, Tanya, she says, forget work. I want to learn illustration. So she says, I've worked out as a I've worked as a layout designer, tabletop games designer, a fantasy map illustrator for years. That sounds like three dream jobs. Mm-hmm. You know how cool would that be? Uh, I don't know how much big the demand is for fantasy maps, but um, you know if you can I'm get that. I'm trying to find this in her in her email. Where where are you seeing that? She makes right. fantasy. It's the first the line. It's the oh, very yeah. okay. first, first line. First line. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Don't okay, go. No, Where found on it. earth I does it say it. that? It's so funny. That's the only line I didn't read because I was like, surely she didn't lead with that. So I was digging down into the into the text. But okay, go ahead. All right. She says a lot of stuff, but um, uh, I'll, I, it, she narrows it down to this, but boils it down to this. How do you manage to change your career when you still have to sustain yourself while learning the new skill? Mm. Um, so the question is: Is how do you, you like how do you do that? How do you balance learning and shifting careers while still <clears throat> having to learn it, earn an earn a living 
Learn an inning. <laughs> fumbling fumbling all over today, that. A little the bit. answer the answer to this one is not fun. Mm-hmm. And what it what it is is all I think all three of us. I'll speak for myself. There were there were times where I was transitioning out of I I, I was already talking about working in editorial, doing um, those illustration for business clients and mm-hmm. like I did annual reports. There were a lot of uh, illustrations that uh, a lot of companies that hired me to do that as well as um, editorial and I was hating it. And so, yep. The, the short answer is you got to work <laughs> another job switching over. So I was redoing my portfolio. I would, I would work on those assignments. I would work on marketing to get more of those assignments. Right. Mm-hmm. I would work on sending my portfolio out to get more of those assignments that I hated because I had a family to, to feed. Right. Mm-hmm. So I had to keep that plate spinning even though I didn't, I, even though I wanted to transition to children's books. Yeah. And, um, and I had to redo my portfolio for children's books at the same time. And that meant, uh, 12 hour days, sometimes six days a week, sometimes even. Well, you didn't, you didn't catch the last part of her question because that, that is part of it a little bit. She said, just a side note, I can't push myself too hard right now because both due to work and personal reasons, I had three burnouts last year. Or three big peaks of the same one, the same yeah. burnout. I, I mean, there's, that's why I say there's no easy answer. I mean, that is, is the no that, for answer. me that is the answer. And if you can't, um, I mean, the, the 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 phrase that I love the most is that um, wealth is created in your spare time, and that just means that for some points of time in your life, you don't have spare time. You know, I used mm-hmm. to talk to my students, and I used to ask them, you know, like. Because, you know, and all, all we can ever base our our um, our worldview on is our own experience, right? I mean, I don't know what it's like to be Lee White, thank goodness, or, or Jake Parker. <laughs> and and uh, it might be amazing to be Lee White. I don't know. I have oh, no is. idea. But, um, you know, I would talk to my students and I'm like, if you are like I was when I was in school, I had this thing when, when it was Friday night, it was time to, to party, you know, Mm -hmm. it was time to have fun. I was always looking after, after classes, I was always looking for like, what, what are the guys in the dorm doing? You know, who's going to go skiing, who's going to go do this and that. And, and quickly I realized I saw the students that were excelling and they weren't doing any of that stuff. They weren't playing. I mean, I got, I flunked out of school um, the first go around because I was always picking up a group was leaving the dorm and where are you guys going? Oh, we're going to go play basketball in the pool. Count me in, you know, <laughs> then that group's the coming back to study. Pig. Yeah. 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 Then that, that group was coming back to study. Another group leaving. Where are you guys going? Oh, you guys are going to hike the mountain. I'll, I'm going to go jump on that. I had a great time. My first year of college <laughs> until it was yeah. over. So I flunked Will, out. Will in his first year of college was who's afraid <laughs> of the big bad wolf. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, the, there is no easy answer. You have to kill yourself. And the cool thing is when you do, it comes to an end because you'll get what you want and you'll find yourself in a situation like, and I'll, I mean, I feel like I'm in this, the, the most perfect situation right now I could ever be in, um, in my career and doing mm-hmm. what I want to do and having time to do what I want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was, that was, I afforded that to myself through those, those, those years that were burnout years that were tough, you know, yeah. I, well, I feel I like I earned she, that. If she's already a illustrator, she's already a pro illustrator. I don't think this transition is going to be the same for everybody. And for her in particular, it's probably going to be very quick. I mean, mm. she's not going to struggle with, uh, like our, our previous, um, person who wrote in that was where she tried, got to figure out the market and the medium and all that stuff. This person probably is very fast. If they've already been a fantasy map illustrator, that means they know how to control detail. I bet this switch can be a quick one for this particular person, but I think Will's advice is, is spot on. Um, the other thing I was going to add is find a way to A, reduce your costs, and then B, mm-hmm. reduce your workload so you can have two, basically have a part-time job 
that you make money at and then a part-time job where you're learning this new transitional illustration thing. And then once that actually starts making money, then eventually you can quit the part-time job. Um, but you can't, I mean, to think that you're going to work 40 hours a week, take care of a family if you have kids or whatever too, and then also learn something on the side, that's it's just asking for too much. And you got to figure out, okay, how can I start to reduce this? Not how can I add more, but how can you take away more to give yourself the time? Mm. Yeah, I was going to, I was going to say that when I, transition from animation to illustration it was less about um learning you know learning the skills because a lot of that translated really easily one to the other i mean you know how to draw a character in an environment you just shift shift it to from here's a composition for a you know for an animation, for a frame and animation or concept art. And then you change it for here's the layout for a book and how you, you kind of, so really what it was, was less about um, developing the skills and more about making the portfolio that would get me that work. And it, it meant, it really did mean like lots of late nights, lots of not going out. And I, I read this, I forget where I saw this. It was, I think, a YouTube comment. <laughs> but it, every once in a while, there's wisdom down in the in the comment section of YouTube. And <laughs> this one guy said, he said there, it, he said two years and a plan is all it takes. And he said that came for to him from some entrepreneurial rich friend that he has. And he's like, you just need two years and a plan, hmm. and uh, and you could pretty much get anything going that you need to get going. Mm. And and I took that to mean, and, and essentially I, I did that as well. In two years, I made two graphic novels. And that was my plan was to shift from um, animation to publishing. And it took two years of just grinding and late nights and, and doing it. And then I was able to shift into uh, quitting the animation and going into going into publishing more full time i did teaching to kind of bridge the gap financially but the teaching job was a way for me to not work 40 hours a week but still make the income and and downsize my life and everything and still make the income i needed so that i could make that transition a little bit easier because mm-hmm. the first few jobs in publishing weren't weren't paying you know enough to pay to cover all the bills right mm. Um, so yeah, I will, you guys are all right. It's, it's not easy. There's like, what's the easiest way? Uh, you know, it's the, the obstacle is the way that there's a book all about how, if you have to go, if you have to do something hard, the only way to get through it is, is not going around it. It's not digging a hole under it, not climbing over the top of it, but just plowing right through it. Mm -hmm. I will say this, me, me and my wife have come up with a little saying that, that, comes out in all kinds of different situations, but the common denominator is transitions are difficult. That's what mm-hmm. we realize. Whether you're moving, yeah. like we're getting ready to think about moving to Colorado, whether you're changing jobs, any kind of transition, you just got to brace for that, you know, turbulence because it's there. Yeah. There's no smooth one, rare or rarely is there a smooth one. Right. So just know. I that's mean, coming. think about think about even like think about the the shift from caterpillar to butterfly. You know what happens when they build a cocoon and they're sitting in there? Like, do you actually have you ever read up on what happens? I, I've only so, used the Eric Carl book as my guideline. There. <laughs> well, that's pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> so they eat and eat and eat, right? Oh, they're they hungry. make this chrysalis, yeah. <laughs> and what happens inside this chrysalis is their cellular structure completely breaks down and they turn into a soup. Like if you cut one of wow. those apart, it is just a mishmash of of like goo, and then little by little that goo starts turning into I'm going to be an antenna, I'm going to be a compound eye, I'm going to be, you know, a little nectar feeder tongue thing, I'm going to be legs, I'm going to be wings, I'm going to be an abdomen, you know, I'm going to be these reproductive organs, and and then a butterfly comes out. Do you, and can you imagine, you know? If there are nerves, how painful that would be to turn your body to goo and then reform it into a completely different. Well, it's being. like that. It's like that first X Men when the guy, you know, he turns into water. Mm-hmm. Just kind of probably like yeah. that. Probably a lot like that. Yeah. 
So <laughs> if you're changing, if you're changing from a caterpillar to a butterfly, there's there's this time where it's just gonna be rough and gooey and messy, and <laughs> you just gotta roll with it. <laughs> Okay, wow. next question. Hey, can I can I make an announcement real quick? Speaking of changing things, yeah, this is for people. If you guys are listening to us or reading us, <laughs> 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 there's an alternate form of 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 this of this podcast, and you can go to our YouTube channel and actually see us talking about this stuff. The reason I want to mm-hmm. point people there is because I'm on Beard Watch 2021. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna cool. say. There's, slowly there's like coming three in. three or I'm, four hairs yeah, sticking I'm four days there. in. Since I'm going to Colorado for a month, I thought, mm-hmm. you know what? I, I need a beard to go with you my need Colorado a, a adventure. Face warmer. <laughs> face warmer for, for Colorado so I can so I can fit in, in the in the mountains. And so if you go to our YouTube channel over the next couple of podcasts, you're gonna see Beard Watch 2021. <laughs> and I noticed there's a little gray in that beard. Yeah, I'm gonna have to dye that or something. I don't I didn't expect that. <laughs> Hey, I've never had a beard before, so I don't know. I don't know what's happening right now. <laughs> it's very the, itchy and feels weird. At the end of Tanya's uh, letter here, she says, "No words are enough to express how much SVS is helping me change my life regarding illustration. SVS was the biggest blessing of the year for me." I just have to say, whenever I read something like that, it just makes me feel so good of what we're doing. I know? yeah, I feel good like, about that too, but I'm frustrated because I was just about to do a real zinger on Lee. And you you missed, oh, it's, uh, the moment's passed. The moment's, the moment's passed. passed. Now I'm just going to oh. sound like a jerk. <laughs> Anyways, yes. moving on. The next one. Sorry, Jake. Beard Watch 2021. Beard Watch 2000. Yeah, it's going to say, <laughs> this is amazing. Lee's finally going through puberty. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's all grow beards. Let's just do a, a SBS beard, years. beard thing. If you guys want to do that? I, I did a cross country mountain bike or a road bike ride, and all the guys I was doing that with, we all decided to grow really ugly mustaches. Like you couldn't do anything to the mustache to make it look cool, like handlebar mm-hmm. mustache. So it had to look like a 1970s like crap mustache, mm-hmm. and uh, it was super fun. So we should do a, we should do an yeah, SBS beard. I'd be down. Beard. I just get so stinking itchy. I can't handle the That's itchiness. That's the phase I'm in now. It's only four days in. You can't five stop days playing in. with it. It's the, the two-week itchiness that gets me. Well, I have never been there. Yeah, come back right. to me in two weeks and let me know how you're feeling. We it might look actually exactly be the same. doing a podcast right now, guys. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite beard okay. grooming product? <laughs> this is I, how quick we get derailed. Can we talk about I the know. elephant foot conversation? That, no, okay, no, I'll save that. Can I do like tea about- tree, though, for, for hair stuff. So... That they make good, they make good stuff because you can actually run your fingers through it, and it still holds. Okay, Nancy says teaching art and working <laughs> freelance. <laughs> what Thank is you happening? For, I don't know. <laughs> teaching art and working freelance. Thank you for creating the children's book pro course. I've already learned a lot in the past week. Always good to hear that. All three of you have taught illustration in higher ed. I'm thinking of pursuing that route after my MFA in illustration. In your experience, what helped you to get hired? What were your expectations of teaching initially, and how did that change during your teaching career? Is it viable to be a freelancer and teach at the same time with teaching obligations? I appreciate the podcast and all the advice. has been amazing. Oh, I want this one. I want this one too, but I'll let Will take it. Let me start out. It's like sharks, blood Mm. in the water. Circling. (laughs) So first off... um, what helped you get hired is portfolio. I know a lot of people who have their MFAs who cannot get a job because they don't have the portfolio to support um, the hiring. And one of the things that a lot of people don't know is that when you get hired, when, when you apply for um, a full-time teaching position in illustration, they are looking, they're not looking for the, the person who is super, um, amazing in one style. They're looking for the person who's really good in three or four or five styles. So mm-hmm. they need you to, they need to be able to plug you into figure drawing, but you also need to be able to teach, you know, an illustration one or an illustration four course. They need you to be able to um, have good um, light and shadow. They need you to be able to teach a drawing class. So, um, and to be able to demo different styles and different mediums. So that's number one. 
is you've got to have the portfolio to support it. Um, and then the, the, the second part of that question for me was the, how viable is it to ha- still have a freelance career? And unfortunately, when you go full time, I don't know any, any of my friends who are um, full time illustration teachers that maintain a freelance business. Except for, except for me. <laughs> I, I well, did but it for you're, you're years. a workaholic. You're a workaholic. You are an anomaly on that. I give you hats off to you. Literally, if you're on YouTube, I'm taking my hat off. <laughs> right but my, my, my visor is not even a hat. Look at that. How sad Your half that? hat. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, um, but no, you're, you're not normally. You're, uh, I, I wondered how many people actually, I mean, I agree with your point is how many people stay. The reason they, they bail is because a, they get a taste of just consistent money and they don't need to actually be an illustrator. But mm-hmm. then the demand of a te- full-time teacher is so high. Mm-hmm. They make you go to all these dumb meetings and that you don't even need to committees. Be they, yeah. All that. Yeah, it's, 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 silly. you're burnt and the la- and then you come home and your spouse wants to do stuff or you, I mean, you've made, you've got your salary, your bills are paid. You, you know, mm-hmm. they, they, they feed you, they put you they have insurance. You, yeah. You're in the shade, you know, you've got a nice place to live. Um, I don't know. It's a, it's a good deal. It's a good gig if you can get it and you can control it. Um, how I controlled it when I was full-time faculty instructor and, and full-time illustrator is I just told them when they asked me to do all these meetings and all these committees, I said, you wanted me to be a working illustrator. If you will out loud and on paper, write, we don't care if you're a working illustrator anymore. We would rather you be at these meetings and you sign it. I will quit working in the field and, or I'll That's quit That's so here. awesome that you did that and- <laughs> because it is, it is diametrically opposed. It is. Right. So you here's what it. happens. And I've talked to these guys. You're right. They say you have to be to all these meetings. You have to teach all these classes and you have to maintain a professional career so that because they know that you're completely irrelevant if you don't. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. And so so what happens? The teachers pretend they 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 pretend to have a career. They or, jump or they, through they, call, they call going to a workshop being a career. That's like career right. training. It doesn't right. matter what you do. It's not, it's not a real so they career. Do, <laughs> they do things. And I don't, and I'm not faulting the teachers at all. This is the system. No. They have to, they jump through hoops and do things that are stupid to try to maintain the facade of having a career. Yeah. Cause they it's have crazy. to. It's do you want to know so my dumb. other, my other passive aggressive way that I dealt with that kind of stuff? Yeah. I got, I got to hear this. This is a good one. They they uh, they eventually wouldn't let me out. I had everybody on uh, uh, the our little art department crew had to take on some kind of service job service job within the university, and they I said no, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. Finally, they appointed me the person who takes care of like all the wall art and decoration, and mm-hmm. uh, for all you know, we had three floors. I mean, it's huge. And um, mm-hmm. I was like, man, this is gonna take forever. Like doing all this stuff. So what I did is I went to the print center and I had them make the biggest prints that were capable on our large format printers. And I printed hundreds of print files from my students and I put it all over the entire school. And it took like, it took like <laughs> a four days to, for me to put all this stuff up. So for, so for like a Thursday through a Sunday, cause I wanted to be there when nobody was there. And then I got an email on Monday saying, we do not want you being in charge of the walls anymore because it cost them thousands of dollars in printing. <laughs> like it was, it was so much. They're like, please stop printing. And I was like, no, 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 that's my job. I'm taking care of the wall art. <laughs> and it was what a lot. Their expectation. I mean, what was their expectation? Oh, then I would make like little, I would make little exhibitions and stuff like that. And I mean, it was super passive aggressive. I don't think it's a bad ask to put student work in the hallway. It's just to put it on me. It's not going right. to happen. If right. you want me working in the field. <laughs> Right. Mm-hmm. I need to be able to mm-hmm. go and teach my class and go home and work. Right. But it was great yeah. when they asked me to please stop. Cause I was like, no, no, no stuff's printing right now. Yeah. Please stop. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever noticed that in <laughs> along with this question with the MFA thing that, that a lot of illustrators come out worse in some ways after their MFA? Oh, really? I've noticed that. Well, they tri- So what happens is, you know, you have to come up with some sort of vision. You have to, take peyote and go out in the desert and figure out <laughs> like some kind of weird vision that's different from what you've been doing. And then I, I, I've seen it in three different artists work where it, it's almost like it ruined. Them. Wow. Yeah. I I've seen some way. pretty cool MFA stuff too. 
Well, I got my MFA and, and it was, it was just but a so time where I could through focus. An on, you went, went through that illustration illust MFA. Yeah, it was dedicated. MFA, and I would assume that anybody who wants to do this is going to go through. Yeah, a dedicated but they don't, they go through the, the peyote course. Oh, you don't want to do that. that. But I mean, yeah. I, I just use it as a chance to focus on a single you know, It's basically thesis based and you come up with a project. Hey, I'm going to make this. It's a great way if you're, if, you know, talking about transitions to transition, but did I have to pay $45,000 to, to do this transition? I really didn't. Um, my school was making me do it, get the, um, the MFA and then the school mm -hmm. went under, of course. You did the uh, Boston. <laughs> what was I that did the one? Hartford, Hartford, Hartford yeah. illustration school. It was, it was, it was okay. And that was taught by an illustrator. What was his name? Um, and his and it was Murray Tinkleman school. Murray Tinkleman, yeah. And, uh, you know, we had some good, we, we, we saw, uh, Gary Kelly and you know, there's all kinds of, and that's I made an, some great, great. That's friends a rare, that. pro rare program too. Cause most MFAs are not taught by, I mean, are not offered by illustrators. I still think you can do it, the same thing for nothing. Um, I, unless you really want to teach and it's going to be full time. And by the way, I just wanted to make this point. I think the full time teaching gigs are going away because it doesn't benefit the school to hire a full time person when they can hire a bunch of different adjuncts for almost nothing. And um, the quality of education goes down. They don't care so much as long as the class is being taught and people are signing up for the class. The incentive for a school to hire a full time person, and I, I'm going to specifically call out PNCA in Portland. There, they have a department chair. They have one person who's a full time illustration uh, department illustrator or teacher, and then everybody else is adjunct. And every and all the adjuncts are just sitting there waiting to get their chance to go, oh, maybe I'll get the full-time nod. Maybe mm. maybe a job will come open. It never does because mm. there's no reason for it to. Mm -hmm. I, I know. That's, um, that's a shift that's been happening in the last, what, 15, 20 years? Yeah, mm. for sure. I know about five people that have their MFAs that are in different careers now because they, they, they kept applying at different universities and different art schools. And finally, they, for whatever reason, a couple of them, I can see why they never got hired. Um, they just didn't have the portfolio to back it up at all. You know, like I really do think we're going to see <clears throat> like this might be we're going to some big shift is going to happen with higher education because it's across the board because it's just it's it's a it, it's very messy. The amount of debt that we're leaving yeah. students with you know, going into the workforce with all this debt, the amount of, I, I want to say the, the ratio of your qualifications leaving versus the kind of jobs that are needed to fill, be filled. And I almost feel like, you know, there needs to be some version of like a art trade school, you know, where it's less about getting a degree and a and an MFA, and it's more like you're you're actually working and creating things and and working in the field before you you know as you're learning that sort of thing. And you there's see a that, of, yeah. There's a couple well, of programs that work like that, and I I studied at them both in in Los Angeles. Uh, mm -hmm. You see, I'm gonna right. I was gonna say you see that in Los Angeles a lot with the entertainment industry. Yeah, concept Go design ahead. academies that way, and then and mm -hmm. Watts Atelier and uh, Associates and of Art was a big one. Noma, mm -hmm. yeah, those were and those were all in L.A., but they were fantastic. People would take whole terms off of undergraduate degree work to go to mm -hmm. one of these schools, focus for a semester. I used to do that for figure drawing, and then I'd go back. And you also saw that uh, in um, in programming, like learning to code mm -hmm. and things like that. There's a place called Dev Mountain in Utah. And those guys are like, hey, and I think it's, you know, three months or four months will teach you essentially everything you need to know to go get a six figure job, <laughs> you know, working for some um, tech company. And the tech companies are like, please keep them coming. We, we need more and more of these people. Right. You know? Can't even fill it. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, last thing with this is at, at the, at the core of it, at the base of it, if you're and and it goes with every question we've sort of answered today, there's two opposing ideals or mm -hmm. there's two, two opposing forces in everyone's life, experience and security. Okay. And you have to figure out where the threshold is, how much experience you want to have versus how much security you want to have. And if you're a person who just needs 
solid, like good security, you know, not have to worry about anything. A freelance illustration career is going to give you an ulcer. <laughs> <laughs> good point. <laughs> right? And if you're a person who's super adventurous and you're like, you know, I'll, you know, I'll kind of figure it out on the, on the fly and, and I need to just get out there and do stuff, you're going to suffocate in a secure job you know, where you have to show up every day at nine o'clock and, and it's the same, you know, thing over and over. And so you just have to figure out where you are. And it might be that you're like, I am 30% security, 70% experience. And so I found a thing that kind of works for me, or I am 80% security, 20% experience. So you get a good solid, you know, job with benefits. And then that 20% is you doing like side jobs, freelance on the side or something like that. So uh, Can I there, add some, a, a different w- angle to something that we haven't really talked about with this question. Mm-hmm. And that is the, I mean, we've kind of been, I think Jake's right. You got to figure out what kind of person you are and then what the, what are the opportunities that it's there? I don't recommend the MFA for most people like Will was saying. Um, but the one thing I do want to emphasize is the benefits of teaching. One thing that Jake, Will, and I all have in common, for sure, one thing that we agree on <laughs> every time is that we love the process of teaching all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And, and the benefit that we get from it is, is awesome. We love seeing the spark in the student's work. And we uh, there's nothing better when, than when a student levels up and all of a sudden they create a piece that they couldn't have created a month ago. Mm-hmm. And you can just see it on them. It's, it's, it's so intoxicating because they're so excited and they just can't, you can tell they're so proud of it and they should be. Um, and there's just something, there's something so magical about that moment. But there's also the selfish thing too of how do you, you know, we've been talking a lot. How do you get better? How do you get better? Well, as teachers, you're not, you don't know everything and, and you got to be open to being a constant learner, a constant student. And when I have to prepare a lecture for somebody on anything, whether it's like, here's the drawbacks of using a two point perspective versus a one point perspective. Well, now I really got to think about that. How do I convey this, this, these mm-hmm. things that I haven't even really thought about on my own. I mean, I've maybe do them in, in, uh, intuitively, but when you've got to teach something to somebody, you got to lay down the steps of what's essential and what's not. And that process will make you a much better illustrator than you mm-hmm. could ever be. And so being a teacher is something I highly recommend, whether that's a formal thing or you're just trying to help a group. If you're, a, if you're an advanced student trying to uh, offer up you know, some mentorship to some beginning students, um, it will benefit you and them in equal measures. And only teach if you can answer yes to this next thing, which is, um, do you want to, do you truly want to help your students? I mean, do Mm -hmm. you really care about other artists? If you Mm -hmm. don't, you should not teach. (laughs) Mm -hmm. You really have to care, um, about their learning or you'll be a horrible teacher because you have to be able to share. Yeah. And, and we, we had a guy at, at UVU who I won't mention his, his name, but you know, my students came into class one day all upset and they're like, so-and-so just said that we might as well, um, you know, kind of give up the idea of making money as an artist. I was like, wait, what? What did he actually exactly say? And they went through, you know, he he just said, "You just, it's just impossible today to make a living as an artist. And I'm like, okay, well, then I gave them, I gave them like five illustrators that had been out of school for a year or two that were making really good money. Mm-hmm. And I said, go and go and ask him what he would say about these guys. Cause it's easy for him to say about someone, you know, he's an old, he's, he was like 10, 15 years older than me. It's mm-hmm. easy for him to say about, you know, older artists. Cause I mean, the thing that he was saying was you can't do it today, but you could do it back in the day. Well, he failed at every attempt and he was just sitting there. He didn't teach. He was a horrible teacher. I knew people that had him. Um, and he was one of those that was just like, okay, uh, get your work going. And, uh, then he would disappear during class and they'd just be in there like what's going on. And then he would show up again and was department chair for a while too. You know, these, and, and institutions are rife with people like that. There are some amazing teachers. I'll shout out to Perry Stewart, one of the best, uh, illustration teachers I've ever known. And he would, he also at UVU, he would, I had classes at my class would come in after his using the same room 
And often we couldn't get started on time because he was still working with a couple of students. Mm. You know, yeah. I mean, you, you can tell those teachers they're they're yeah. they're so good. Oh, wanna, and he was amazing. He's an amazing artist, and the dude loves to create art, loves it. That's another thing. Don't trust any teacher that doesn't love to to make art. Mm-hmm. They, they go hand in hand. If you don't love making art, you cannot teach. <laughs> right? Don't trust don't trust any teacher who doesn't want to give away a secret or something right. like that. And don't be that kind of person either. I'll show you right. exactly how I do what I do. I'll answer. And all, all three of us will. We'll show you the materials. Yeah. We'll show you the thing. And then you'll make your own version of it. You're, I'm not worried about you becoming a, 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 another version of me. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. bother me a bit. But there are teachers out there, like somebody in my MFA, where I said, hey, they were showing a Photoshop file. I said, can you show us the layer stack of that? Because I want to see how it was. A, it was specifically a class on textures. And she said, no. <laughs> <laughs> she just literally said no i don't i don't show that to my students and I was right. like, okay, that is you, you so suck. much bs right there mm-hmm. there's some there are yeah i agree if you if you don't like teaching you don't like art <laughs> you don't like creating <laughs> don't I become don't like an sharing. art teacher <laughs> yeah you gotta share you gotta just give it give it but, all away and you'll get some in return but you guys are right it it creates accountability in your own work when you teach I mean, think about it. You teach people how to do something right, and then you don't do that thing that you told them to do. So now yeah. that you're teaching, your words are in your head. And now you're going, well, I guess I better follow the rules I just gave to them. And so you level up that way. The other thing is when you break down a concept and you try to figure out a way to to explain it, there is something magical that happens in your brain where mm-hmm. you make associations and you have epiphanies that you would have never had if you hadn't tried to break it down into a lesson by, you know, bite sized portions. It's just, it's mm-hmm. just, it's amazing. Mm-hmm. That's for sure. All right. Last question. Um, Ellen, her, her, there's way we're too going, many We're going pretty deep points. on this. I mean, we're, we're already at a minute or an hour. Uh, how, how do we have enough time? I guess is my question. We, this is going to be a short one. Really short. Okay. okay. We'll finish it because I know we usually do three, but this is a short one. We're just, I'm sliding this one in at the end okay. here. There's entirely way too many exclamation points for us to like take it too <laughs> seriously. But, but uh, uh, no, uh, Ellen says procreate Photoshop, how to use to create illustrations. So essentially, and I'll just boil it down to this. Her question is, can you suggest for me your and your viewers where you can, uh, where you can do, where you can go to see lots of videos. And, man, I'm butchering this to death. <laughs> okay, starting from the top. She wants to know where, what's the best place to learn how to use Photoshop? What's the best place to learn how to use Procreate? Is there, is you just search YouTube. There's so many videos on YouTube. Is there one resource to learn all this stuff? Oh, God, that's My, what you were talking about earlier. Oh, go ahead. You're gonna answer. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, here's the problem is Procreate and Photoshop are always getting updated. And, and you know, if you make a tutorial today, it might be outdated next right. year, right? And Will's done that. We have we have Photoshop class that, that's, you know, done with... It looks like it was done back during King Louis the 14th, you know? Yeah, right. So um, you're not going to find a lot of up-to-date stuff uh, with, I mean, you're going to have to go to YouTube essentially to find any of the up to date. Mm-hmm. Like, here's how you do, here's how you use all this stuff, um, because it just doesn't make financial sense for someone to sell a, a very, you know, a, a, a course that's very direct and specific on Procreate version, you know, nine or whatever version they're on now, knowing that version ten is going to come out next year with with new updates the other thing is everybody uses it differently so if you do get on a good tutorial they're going to go off on things that you just don't care about i i personally i think you you figure out what you want what kind of marks or what kind of look what kind of texture what kind of art you know strokes you want to make and then you try to make those in photoshop and when you get Mm -hmm. stuck you go and figure out why you can't do the thing you want to do or how to do it. Yeah. Um, and that's how I learned it. I never had a class. Um, I just learned it over time. And there, and I still, I'll bet you, I only know 
maybe three or five percent of what it does. I've taught yeah. Photoshop at high school, and uh, I, I don't know what this program can do because there's so many things. There's like ten ways to do the same thing, maybe a hundred. So mm-hmm. you don't need to learn every single way to do us the same thing, but also, like you said, it changes and there's just stuff in there. There's tools in there that I'll never use. So the worst to me is, is taking any kind of a general course that I don't know. I, I'm too ADD for, mm-hmm. for learning that way. I, I, I try to make something. Then I, I call a friend, like, if you were trying to do this, let me share my screen. That's the other thing you have zoom now. So you can just share your screen with someone who knows Photoshop and go, mm-hmm. how do I do this? Mm-hmm. I will say this, the best the best thing you could do if you're trying to learn a program is do a master copy because it gives you very specific marks you have to make versus mm-hmm. if you start with a blank, blank canvas in Photoshop, oh, what are you going to pick? The airbrush, the pencil, the charcoal? Right. I mean, it That's could be anything, um, but you do mm-hmm. a master copy. It's like, okay, it's very specific and you will get so good, especially if it's a master copy in the direction that you want to go. Um, mm-hmm. Even a master copy of something that you did traditionally is a mm-hmm. great way to learn. Mm-hmm. Um, so I recommend that. Any, one, yes. any of these programs, just give yourself an assignment. I'm going to make, you know, I'm going to make five different pieces using just this Photoshop or just Procreate. And by the end of those five pieces, if you don't understand that software, um, you know, there's might be something you might, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Well, and then, and then you I do mean, have the YouTube. Beauty. You have YouTube for little things like how to make a seamless texture. You know, like you, right. you know what I mean? Like you want to use a texture brush, but you don't want to have, you don't want it to, to tile right. on you. You know, so and that's the kind of specificity you'll get into if you're trying to make something specific versus just kind of right. generically playing around in Photoshop. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, this edge is this is a soft edge. How do I make a soft edge? Well, now you're onto YouTube. How do I make a soft edge? It's a very specific question. Um, or how do I make a textured brush or a wobbly brush or whatever? At, versus just going in. There. If you just open the program, start messing, you will just be flying all over the place. There's a million buttons. There's a million right. brushes. Yeah, start with the brush. And the like, I, my kids are learning digital tools now. Um, uh, they're learning Photoshop. They're learning how to animate and, and Flash. I know Flash is like on a very old, not supported anymore program, but I still have it on an old computer, and it's perfect for like teaching the kids basics of how to do a bouncy ball and stuff like that. And I, all I do is I show them here's how you um, here's how you make a mark. Here's how you erase a mark. And here's how you uh, control Z. Here's how you fix a mistake. Essentially, you know, you can you can select all and cut it, or you can paste it, or you can control Z. And I just give them that. Oh, and here's how you pick a color, right? You know, and and I don't even teach them about layers or anything. That was like the first thing. And then I'll add, okay, here's layers. Here's how you use layers. And then I'll add, here's this other tool you use and. And that's the same thing you want to do for yourself is you don't complicate it. And even my, I mean, you guys probably do this too. Like even at this stage of working with Photoshop for 20 years, I'm still YouTubing things like, oh my gosh, Mm -hmm. how do I, how do I do that one thing? Because it's a $500 program or a $50 a month program. And everything I need to do on Photoshop probably costs $10 out of that 50 (laughs) Yeah. You know, I always say I've got, I've got like a, basically I've got a 10, 10 item <laughs> selection list of what I use in Photoshop. There's 10 uh-huh. things that I use this brush and this brush, this tool and this tool, you know, it's just, it's such a small little window yeah. of, of this giant Vista that I'm choosing and everybody's got the so different window that they pick. All of that to say it feels daunting because there's all those tools and all those buttons and drop down menus and everything. And it doesn't have, don't get overwhelmed. Just just stay in that nice narrow thing. And for Pete's sake, you know, you really want to feel like you're dropped in the deep end. Try to learn a 3D program like Maya or oh Blender gosh. or <laughs> something like that. And it is like magnitudes more Wait, complicated. Did you just do if you think your life is hard? Yes, I did. No. That's well, I'm I'm just I'm I'm saying like uh you're just scratching the surface surface. Here's the thing: <laughs> okay. painting and drawing are simple in, in the traditional world, right? Mm-hmm. Pick up a pencil and you make marks with it. You pick up a paintbrush 
you load it heavy, you load it medium, you load it light, you thin it, you use it thick, use the edge of the brush, use the, the flat side, use a round, use a, a, a rigger brush for line work. I just described, you know, five or 10 tools, simple, right? Mm-hmm. That's how your painting in Procreate or Photoshop should be. Mm-hmm. It really should. Yeah. You, you you learn one thing one day and then you learn another thing and pretty soon in a year you you've got everything you need and then you can still add things to it later on i think the the most dangerous thing to teach someone just learning photoshop is to teach them how drop shadow or embossing or blur tool works first yeah like (laughs) don't 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 use it don't use any trick that you can't do traditionally that's right so like when we went lee when you said um (laughs) you know, learn how to make a, 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 a blurry edge. I started to cringe because, and I know what you're talking about, but I start cringing because I'm like, Oh no, there, there are tutorials out there on like how to make a blurry edge. Well, this is how one artist makes a blurry edge. Well, you know, you, if you're painting traditionally, you don't, you don't, there's not one way to make a blurry edge. Right. right? So you, and you, you can make it with little scrubby strokes or you could make it with, thick light strokes, you know, and so well, that's why I said it yeah. in the context of doing a master copy, because if you have a, like a, like say a soft edge shadow that wraps around a, a round form, like a ball, if you do some wacky version of it, like you use the smudge tool, yeah. it's not going to match. You know, that's you'll right. get that. There's always a gimpy way in Photoshop and that what, looks awful. And what people end up doing is they use 50 different tools to make an, an image right. and it, and it looks digital that's because true. The blurry is in the crisp area. The crisp is in the blurry. Where, what should be blurry? Um, there's, there's there's no consistency through the painting. You should uh-huh. be using the same brush through the whole painting and then switching and using the same brush, the next brush that you use through the whole painting. And yeah. Focus on keeping it simple. I mean, on all yeah. of it, you know, some people were talking about traditional work or digital work and all that. Focus on keeping it simple. I tell you, I did a whole series um, at the beginning of, I guess it was about midway through last year, where I just used a, a mechanical pencil and a piece of paper. And it was so relaxing to go back to that after and get rid of all the technique and all that stuff and just be like, okay, I got a pencil, I got mm-hmm. a piece of paper, and that's it. And 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 it doesn't have to be so complicated. I post them on Instagram. Everybody's like, oh my God, I forgot you could do drawings with just a pencil <laughs> without a bunch of stuff, you know, you know, technique right. and all that stuff. So keep it, if you keep your process simple, like Will was saying, um, it's going to benefit you greatly. Mm-hmm. I love that right. question. I, I had to ask it. I had to slip it in there because I knew you guys had some hot takes on it. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Three Point Perspective is made possible by svslearn.com. We're becoming a great illustrator starts. Uh, go check out SVS Learn. Subscribe to get access to 80 different um, c- courses on how to do everything from You know, basics in Photoshop, we do have a basics in Photoshop. So how to use the brush tool, how to use like these very simple, basic things, Um, all the way to like how to do light and shadow or how to draw everything. Um, If you like this episode, please uh, go to our forum over on svslearn.com where we have a specific topic devoted just to this episode where you can chime in and let us know what you think there. As always, we love to hear your uh, reviews of this podcast. So uh, leave a review on iTunes and, uh, and and however many stars you think we deserve. Um, maybe come up with your own five star rubric on for podcasts and and see where we fit in on that. That'd be great. Um, uh, your hosts today have been. I see. I mix that up. I usually do the host first. Doing it. Doing it. Doing keep, it afterwards. Keeping it today. fresh. Yes. Your host have my been beard, Will Terry. My beard was throwing you. <laughs> it was. Your hosts have been Will Terry, Jake Parker, and Lee White. Uh, Will Terry's artwork can be found at willterry.com. On Instagram, it's at willterryart. Lee White's artwork can be found at leewhiteillustration.com. And on Instagram, he's Lee White Illo. And my artwork can be found at jakeparkerart.com. And uh, I'm at Jake Parker on Instagram. Special thanks to everyone who helped make this podcast possible over at SVS Learn. We've got Daniel, too, as our show producer. 
Uh, that's Daniel T.U., and you could find him, his work at daniel2.co. Uh, David Bro, who's our our main bro at SVS, he's our production manager, helps keeps all the trains running on time. And Lisa Fott, who is our, um, she's our person who does all, like cancels all our emails, social media, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so special thanks to her. And uh, I think that's it, everybody. Thank you. We will catch you next time. Awesome.